Thank you, General Ray. Your opinions are making us see the other side of the spectrum. Uh, the IBDP, IGCSC and the A-levels are creating a big headway into the Indian education system, allowing students to become lifelong learners. Uh, the pedagogy and the method of instruction surely does benefit students who want to pursue an education abroad. Uh, Mr. Sarvate, you've yourself studied abroad and did your master's from Harvard's Graduate School of Education. Uh, international education has truly changed the DNA uh, of education today, uh, be it the online learning or the array of innovative and offbeat courses that these universities provide. Uh, why do you think uh, studying abroad has become so critical today? Uh, how does it compare to the uh, traditional uh, teaching methodologies? We'd like to hear your views on this. Thank you, Abba. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking Mrs. Ratimundre, Chairperson of Fiki Flow, for inviting me to share my thoughts in this esteemed panel and uh, speak on a topic that is very close to my heart, which is reforming Indian education. This is uh, something that I chose a few years back, about 15 years back, I said I don't want to work in the corporate sector in India and I want to work towards reforming Indian education. And I chose a career which was not uh, a teaching career. I decided that I didn't want to work uh, in reforming a school, a classroom, a few children, but I decided I'll take up a bigger challenge. How do we talk about changing the 1.3 million government schools in India? And a large part of my career, I have worked in organizations that are working on systemic change uh, with state governments. So uh, I currently work with an organization called Quest Alliance and also run a startup called Urban Think, which is a platform for thinking differently. And uh, we work in Bihar. Uh, and we're trying to transform 1,000 schools in a district there. And as uh, General Ray was saying, uh, the critical time to make a difference in education in India is the school education. And that's where I think we've lost the battle when we expanded education and made sure that everybody got access to education. And yes, all of us got, you know, all, all children in India got access, but we decreased the quality, increased the marks, inflated the marks, and now everybody gets 100, and so, you know, nobody can be held responsible. Because if you get 100% marks, who is, uh, you know, who is to be held responsible? Because the teachers are saying we are doing a job. The colleges are saying we can't admit you because everybody's got 100, so if you've got 99, we can't admit you. So who are we going to hold responsible? Surprisingly, uh, many researchers in India did very interesting tests, and Pratham, uh, an NGO that does annual survey of education report, have found consistently in most rural locations, as well as urban locations, that Majority, 66% of the children in class 5 cannot read class 2 level text. Uh, the minister spoke about the GER, gro Gross Enrollment Ratio for Higher Education, and he said it's 19%, which basically means 81% of children who join grade 1 never make it to higher education. So if we don't really address schooling in India, we're not making a difference. Uh, Abha asked me uh, to, to speak here, and I'm the last speaker, so I have to wonder what do I have to say, uh, which the previous panelists have not said. And she gave me a good uh, starting point, which is talking about my own education. Um, so, you know, she also started talking about, she started with when, when she started introducing us, she spoke about an education that liberates. And I wondered, did I really have an education that liberated me? And if I did, is that education desirable? Is it scalable? Can a lot of us get it? And what did it liberate me from? So I'll start with two very interesting stories and then talk about 10 points that liberated me in my own education. And a large part of it is at Harvard, and I'll speak about that, and why international education liberated me, in a way. Um, so I, I was once traveling in Uttar Pradesh, in a, and we'd gone to visit a government school. 
and we stopped on the side of a road and there was another private school so i went and talked to a boy there and i said ki aap kya karte ho aap pad rahe ho ye kar rahe ho so he said ha ye hai hamari kitab he was in 8th so i said kya pad sakte ho aap pad ke dikhao apna you know i i hope all of you can understand hindi so i asked him to read from the textbook and he says dekh ke padhna hai ya bina dekhe padhna hai so i said uh, what does that really mean and i said acha dekh ke padho so he said he read out his chapter and then i asked him questions and he didn't know what he had read but this is true across india across our government schools and i've and i've traveled uh, i've worked in azim prem ji foundation for a number of years and i've worked in about 8 to 10 indian states and this is true in every school in india that they can read but they don't understand what they read the second uh, uh, story i want to share is a few years back i was asked to write minutes in a meeting and nothing against taking minutes but uh, while i was writing the minutes i was very frustrated because i couldn't really participate because i was busy trying to note down what other people were saying and immediately the first thought that came to my mind was about my school what what was i doing the teacher was talking the teacher was writing and i was copying 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 all my education has been in small towns my dad uh, was colleague with general ray in the army and we lived in little towns across india and i went to schools which were small schools i never had any exposure i didn't even know that a course called bcom existed before i did my 12th because i was in a small town in rajasthan and there uh, i didn't know that there was a something called commerce and i was lucky that my dad got posted to pune i got into bcom and i did my mba there and then i joined the corporate sector and i said mm, this is not working uh, i i was just not excited by the challenges it was giving me and i said that you know education is a bigger challenge and i wanted to work on that and i took some good advice and i decided that go and study abroad now here is where a transformation happened really because a large part of the last 100 years we have adopted built and nurtured an education system that has made us lose our freedom and for the first time i saw a glimpse of an education system which was gifting that freedom back to me the first was the first very interesting thing that i found was that uh, when i when i was looking for courses so i wanted to do something in education that was my original broad thought i had left my corporate sector life and i decided i'll do something in education this is 1998 and i said what can i do so i went to universities in india and manipal university wasn't there which would allow me to do various other things <laughs> uh, so uh, i went and i talked to them and they said oh you have to do a bed but i didn't want to be a teacher they said oh then you must do an med but for doing an med you have to do a bed <laughs> so i said this is very bad so i said okay let me look at abroad and i started looking at looking abroad and i found uh, a very interesting thing i i was looking at brochures and the brochure was itself freedom i looked at columbia university's brochure and they had 50 masters courses just in education and none of them required me to do a bed and i said wow this is a this is an education just reading that brochure was an education i never knew that i could study so many varied things in education so i applied to lot of places and i managed to get into harvard a very interesting course uh there the first week was a very interesting week and we talked about the choice you know uh, uh, the century of brands and the century of choices and 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 consumerism the first week was called shopping week so i said wow i i have hated shopping all my life <laughs> you know and here i have to do shopping but this is the best shopping week of my life what did what they expected you to do is you could attend any course that any professor was offering in the first two weeks so two weeks were shopping weeks and we could go into any class sit there and listen to what the professor had to say and he was basically selling his course he was saying why should you do this course why will it be interesting to you 
what changes will you do in your own country, in your own world, in your own situation? How will this course help you to change the world? And wow, I was absolutely mesmerized. Never before had I this kind of choice where, you know, there were 100, 150 courses on offer and I could sit through them and say, oh, this looks really interesting. So I had a plan before I went to study at Harvard saying these are the courses I'll study and then when I went for the shopping week, I was blown away. I said, how can I attend 100 classes at once? So I, so I chose a few and I remember one of them I chose, which is superb. It was called uh, uh, Cultures in Education. And it looked at how education culture is developing in different countries around the world. And they used a comparative approach uh, in teaching that class. What it meant was that the professor introduced us to in that 15 weeks of our class to about 50 different countries and the education culture there. And again, it was so amazing to look at what was happening in Malawi, what was happening in Nepal, what was happening in South America, what was happening in so many different places, what all was happening and what people called an education, what did they want? And we read about the Chinese who wanted to be American and the Americans who wanted to be more like Indians, you know, uh, something General Ray talked about also, uh, you know. So, um, another thing which is very interesting, which I found there, was that no teacher taught anything. And this is again very different from any, anywhere in India. The teacher expected us to study before we came to the class. Average reading on a week was 50 to 300 pages per class and we had taken four classes in every semester and average reading was 50 to 300 pages per class and the class time was only three hours. So I had only 12 hours of classes in a week and I had roughly 1500 pages to read every week. So large part of that education was you read you come to class and the teacher builds on it. And what does he build? He builds something which I value the most today in my life is perspective and worldview. And General Ray talked about this. The teacher was not telling us what was given in the book. They were telling us when does this information, when is this information useful? When do we apply this? When, when do you so I, we were looking at educational change and he says, okay, in this country, this is the experience I had and this is why I know that this knowledge that you're getting, how does it get applied in a country X? How does it get applied in a country Y? How does it get applied in a country Z? And in this comparative approach and this choice of understanding how educational change is happening in various countries, slowly I started changing the way I thought about change. And I realized that educational change is difficult and it's more difficult in countries like ours where that it's, it's taken root. The, uh, the, the system of rote memorization uh, that many of the panelists talked about has taken root, has taken deep roots. It's very difficult to remove it. Today as we work on transforming schools, we realize it's extremely difficult to go and tell the teacher, don't teach like this. It takes very long for, for them to actually change. In a brilliant book called Tinkering Towards Utopia, written by two Stanford historians, they said a very interesting thing. It's called Tinkering Towards Utopia. They said no significant school change has happened anywhere in the world. Educational change has happened through tinkering. Little, little changes that you've done over centuries leads to change. The second thing they said was that uh, the third chapter in the book says how schools change reforms. There is no chapter called how reforms change school. They say every reform that you bring to a school, the school chooses only part of it and rejects most of it. And if you can make little changes in a school, you make a difference. And today that is what we're trying to do with governments. We're trying to change little, little things in their systems and hope that bigger change happens. I think I, I need to say one more thing before I sort of uh, sum it up is the, the, the chance of going and studying abroad was also phenomenal. I think a big crucible of our learning was the classroom. And I don't mean the professor. There was a professor who had done a PhD from Stanford who was teaching us and she said a very interesting thing. She says, look around you. There are people in this classroom from 50 different countries. 
I can only teach you 10% through what I speak. The remaining 90% you are going to learn from the colleagues you have here. If you are not going to talk to them, you are not going to learn. In India, we have a, a philosophy that we don't talk much in the class. Yeah? We are not allowed to talk to each other. Fifth, about 50% uh, of our marks in every exam, there were no exams, but 50% of our evaluation was based on interaction, classroom interaction. And if you didn't talk in the class, you finished. <laughs> so there's a, there's a story that, a, that, that the director of teacher education in Stanford told me. She said there was an Indian student who had come. Uh, she'd done uh, a course in Central Institute of Education, one of the leading institutes in India. And she'd gone to do a PhD in, uh, in Stanford. And uh, one of the professors asked her, what do you think? And she, she looked at him frowned at him and said, why are you asking me what I think? I have paid a lot of money and come here to, ask, to listen to what you think. <laughs> and, and the professor was, waited for a little while, took it in and then he says, no. The whole idea of the education system is to develop what you think. And I think, I think these experiences have changed me completely. And I think whatever I've been trying to do in the last 15 years with various organizations, various states, various institutions that I've worked in, has been, I've been trying to instill some of these little, little changes in the way people think. And the platform that we've set up, me and my wife have set up, which is called Urban Think, is also about this. We wanted to call it New Think, but then we deliberately chose a different word. And we said Urban Think. And urban is not urbanization, but urban is how do we start a new wave of thinking. So that's all I wanted to say. And I think, um, you know, hopefully you'll all join us in helping us change education in India. Thank you very much.